Thank you, Walt. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see a lot of friendly faces here, a lot of folks I haven't seen in a while. Um, I'm the least important person you're gonna hear from today because I know the least about all of this, except that I understand probably as well as anybody the imperative behind ag tech and innovation in our sector. And that's because my background is as an advocate, which is a polite way of saying lobbyist. I've spent a lot of years talking to legislators and regulatory officials, uh, both on behalf of this industry and prior to Western Growers, on behalf of other industry groups and other clients. Uh, but in the last 15 years for Western Growers, I've endured a painful journey uh, on behalf of our members in the realization that in spite of our best efforts, our best arguments, our best um, projections of economic realities, in this state and increasingly in other parts of the United States, and I would even say parts of the, of the world, um, the, the laws of economics seem to be either misunderstood or deliberately ignored when policy is made. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, last night, the city of Coachella, uh, down in the desert, passed an ordinance that requires what they call hero pay, or you can think of it as hazard pay, uh, incrementally bumping up by $4 per hour the wages of people working in the ag sector. Now, um, we can all agree that the, the good men and women who have continued to work in our fields and our processing facilities during this pandemic, uh, because they are essential, are heroes, absolutely. But the laws of economics weren't suspended when the governor declared an emergency and when this pandemic hit. You cannot simply assume that farmers and processors and shippers who have long-term contracts or at least seasonal contracts to deliver their produce to grocery chains and food service companies can absorb another $4 per hour when that wasn't baked in the contract. Nor can you assume that the buyers of those products the large grocery chains and food service companies will happily absorb that cost. They won't. They have options. They can source fresh produce from other places in most cases. We have a couple of commodities that we produce in California that are hard to produce elsewhere, but many of them are not hard to produce elsewhere. I've seen in 15 years as an advocate for this industry the increasing movement of capital uh, from California to other states and increasingly to Mexico and other parts of the Americas. It's not because any California grower wants to leave California. It's the last thing they want to do. Greatest climate, Mediterranean climate, great soils, historically pretty strong water supply, although that's gotten shaky too. Uh, but as they've faced these increasing mandates and expectations and costs and legal jeopardy that comes with the mere act of hiring employees. They have to do what's right for the next generation uh, and for the people that they serve. And that increasingly means not investing in California. So why do I mention all that? It's a little bit of a dark picture. About seven years ago, um, our outgoing board chairman, Bruce Taylor of Taylor Farms, delivered uh, basically a command, I think, to the industry um, as he gave his exiting speech as chair. And he made a very, I think, simple and powerful point that brings us all the way to where we are today, which is that in this industry, in the fresh produce industry, and especially crops, we have a whole bunch of very fierce competitors, highly innovative in their own right, but in cutthroat competition with each other, even as they do business with one another, uh, in some respects, they'll also be fighting uh, for the same customers out in the marketplace. And innovation and technology, Bruce went on to explain, uh, had become sort of a proprietary venture, that the large players in the industry were able to develop their own skunk works and develop their own innovations and try and keep it hidden from the rest of the industry, and maybe you get a leg up for two or three or four years until too many guys in pickup trucks see what you're doing and then try to mimic it. And he said, that's dumb when you think about it because ultimately whatever we do and our skunk works, you all are gonna find out about it and you'll mimic it and you'll catch up. So we get a short-term advantage, 
But in the meantime, we're all spending a lot of money to try and get that short-term advantage over each other in the marketplace. Why don't we instead move more as a collective to enable the fast development of technology that goes at some of the very root cause um, headaches that are threatening our viability, especially in California. And he was talking about legislative mandates, regulatory mandates, compliance costs, et cetera. And he's right about that. I mean, the simple fact of the matter is, if the industry can't figure out how to end around the policymakers who refuse to get it, who refuse to understand the nature of these businesses and the economic realities affecting them, then we're not going to make it. We'll have increasing flight of capital outside of California. Nobody wants that. That was really the genesis and the, and the rationale for our initial investment in um, innovation and technology. It takes the physical form of our, our, our innovation center in Salinas, but it has morphed into something much more, uh, thankfully, uh, which is what we're doing here today. And it's what gives me the greatest hope that uh, this industry will overcome all that is, is, has been imposed on it and is still going to be imposed on it, unfortunately, by bad policy making. It's really interesting to see now the attraction that we've created to the specialty crop industry, to fresh produce commodities in the West. When I first got into this discussion, uh, as we launched our innovation efforts, one of the obvious realities was that ag tech capital and investors, um, the companies that are interested in, in creating prototypes, they were all in for corn and soybeans, but very little attention to the specialty crop industry, and that's understandable in a lot of ways. We're, we're not a monoculture or, or biculture agriculture. We've got 400 commodities in California alone. So that's a lot to try and tackle um, if you want to play in ag tech in specialty crops. But I think what we've been able to do, and again, this assemblance is, is, is I think demonstrative of it, is collect the right players across the grower and shipper and processor segment, the VC and investor segment, the industry par partner segment, uh, the providers, and enable us to all envision what we can collectively do to both tackle across the hundreds of commodities that represent specialty crops, the challenges that afflict us, and also create immense opportunity for those who are willing to take the dive. But that only happens with focus, it only happens with organization, it only happens with collective effort, uh, which you know a lot of farmers aren't real fond of. <laughs> farmers are, are notoriously individualistic. Uh, so I think this today represents to me not only a, a really big, audacious, goal-setting exercise to automate our industry, but it also, to me, represents um, a real moment of celebration that from a dispersed and uh, somewhat chaotic conversation that some of us were having 10, 10 years ago, eight years ago, uh, we now have a much more focused and determined conversation and action built around that. Uh, and that's just, to me, very, very exciting because I have felt for some time that, uh, again, we in California especially, and I would say that's, this would be true for producers in other Western states as well, we're living on borrowed time. Our workforce is aging out. We're not replacing them. Wage costs are going up. Cost of hiring people uh, and the litigation that we often face is going up. All of it is going the wrong direction, and it's happening more quickly now. So. We have time pressure, and I think this initiative uh, is going to be driven in part by that time pressure, but also by the opportunity that exists uh, if we get this right, and I'm confident that we will. So it's a really, um, it's a really interesting moment, as I said. I, I feel almost like it's time to declare our moonshot to automate 50% of this industry. That's a, that's a hell of a goal, and if we make it, we'll have a lot to celebrate. If we fall a little bit short, We'll just keep going until we get there. Uh, let me take a, a couple of minutes here to mention um, several of our domestic partners. We have really awesome partners in this industry. Uh, I'm really, really proud of the way we've, uh, again, coalesced around this challenge. So I just want to call out 
several. Some of them are here in the room. Some are uh, watching online, streaming. Uh, from the California Citrus Research Board, Marcy Martin. <coughs> California Citrus Mutual, Casey Kramer, who's here, but I think went out to take a call. Uh, California Fresh Fruit Association, Ian LeMay, my friend back there. Uh, Driscoll's, Strawberries, Grimway Farms, the California Table Grape Commission, Kathleen Nave. Um, UC Riverside, with whom we have an, a memorandum of, under, of understanding, uh, Dr. Ash Alkarani. Ash, did I say that right? Awesome. Uh, we have an MOU as well with the Washington Tree Fruit Research Commission and his Hanrahan. We have an MOU to announce today also with the California Strawberry Commission. Uh, Rick Tomlinson, their president, has uh, agreed to sign an MOU, so he's uh, and his commission is now a full partner. Uh, and I also want to mention uh, I have um, several of my Western Growers directors who are either here in person or online. I'm not going to call them all out because I don't frankly know who all's online. I know my chairman is, Ryan Talley. So hello, Ryan. Uh, Neil Callis is here uh, from our board and also Don Cameron who just recently left our board. Uh, we've had really incredible support from our board of directors over the years for this initiative. It's something that uh, requires an investment of not just uh, money and time, but what we've done is really invest with some risk our own reputation because a trade association is only as good as what it delivers at the end of the day and with a pretty major investment in money and and human capital, uh, we're putting our reputation on the line too. And I just want to thank our board of directors, both uh, current and, and previous, for all the support they've given to these initiatives. Uh, and then as I mentioned, all the names of our partners, I can't say enough about the other industry uh, partners, my counterparts with the other organizations that are involved here and, and have come here today. Um, for all of you to, to know, we're not only tightly wound together around ag tech, but uh, Ian and, and Casey particularly and, and myself and some others in this industry are, are wound very tightly together on the really hard stuff of, of fighting bad public policy and trying to get some good public policy passed. So know that we have a very, very tight alliance in this industry and that all weaves together with what we're doing here in ag tech. So exciting time, uh, wonderful to, to be here and be a very, very, very small part of it. I want to thank all of those who've committed their time and their energies to this initiative and uh, let's go get it. Thank you.